idea for this panel. It's for it to be very interactive. So I want to call out my fellow panelists, Judy, Andres, Leah, and Maricel. Please come to sit in these high chairs with me. I hope none of us falls down these tall chairs. I forgot. Oh, sorry. I, I only forgot to say mention one more thing. Um, you guys already been in a few sessions here, so I not the one to be repetitive, like <laughs> saying the same thing. But uh, this, how, how the Q and A is gonna work? It's just we're gonna have like the small papers. You can write it down the, the the questions that you have, and then just raise your hand at me and David. We, we we're gonna be able say hello to David. Hey, David. <laughs> Um, we, we're going to be together picking up the questions and bringing uh, to, to Natalie to, so we can put these questions together. Okay? So just this is for me. Perfect. Awesome, Rafael. So, yes, yeah, as, as Rafael was explaining, our panel today is about investing in climate solutions in Latin America. And I think, like, when we talk about climate, we each recognize that now it's like the hot topic. Everyone is talking about climate. Even people who don't work on operating climate, like, I live in Cartagena, a city that is 30 degrees all year long, and people don't believe this, but it's 30 degrees all year long. And like, we talk about climate every day because every day it's getting hotter and hotter. And every day extreme events are becoming more common. So even people that don't understand about climate change are talking every day about climate change. And here we are at SOCAP when we are talking about money plus meaning. So of course, we hear a lot of finance institution talking about climate. And I was talking to someone yesterday and saying like, ah, now all the investors want to invest in climate, but what does that mean? But we'll hear that like still, even if everybody wants to invest in climate, we still don't have enough money to invest in climate. And now also the entrepreneurs, all the entrepreneurs are saying like, ah, maybe I have a climate solution and so forth, but what are really climate solutions? So I'm really thrilled today because we have all sides of the spectrums here in this panel. We have. CFIs, we have VCs, we have impact investors, and we have entrepreneurs that are going to be talking about what is it, climate solutions, and what is to invest in climate solutions. So before I present my fellow panelists, I just want to do a sense check of the audience. So can you please raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur? Okay. Raise your hand if you're an investor, if you invest in entrepreneurs. Awesome. Raise your hand if you're a foundation or you invest in investors that invest in entrepreneurs, like <laughs> LP or so forth. Do we have any LPs? Okay, we have one, two, awesome. And raise your hand if you're a service provider, connector, or just, yeah, make all these connections happen. Awesome. So that's great. And so here upstairs, we have also the same thing. Uh, I want to first introduce Judy. And Judy is the chief climate officer of IDB Lab. He develops IDB Lab agenda on climate, so he really has a lot of facts, things to share with us on how climate works, on gender and diversity. Has been with IDB Lab for over 10 years, right? And before that, he worked at IDB office. He has done many publications around climate agriculture. He holds a PhD in economics, and he's Brazilian and based in Washington. And Judy, I want you to share with the audience the personal fact so that when you caught Yuri in the hallways, you can start a conversation with him about knowing something personal about him. Your personal fun fact? My, my, I'm going to choose one of the two. Remember, we had two of them. Um, hands up those who know who Carl Sagan is. Okay, great, because, okay, got it. So once I asked Carl Sagan for bus fare because I'd run out of money and I didn't know it was Carl Sagan, I looked up and said, Oh my God, you're Carl Sagan. You're like my idol from Cosmos and everything growing up. So that's my personal fact. Thank you, Yuri. Next, I'm going to introduce Leah Gonzalez. She's the regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean for Incofin. And Incofin is an impact investor that provides organizations working in financial inclusion and sustainable agriculture financing. She has also been at Incofin for over 10 years, which, come on, like, these guys have been committed to their organizations. And before, she worked in public-private partnerships for infrastructure projects in Latin America. Leah, do you want to introduce yourself with your fun or personal fact? OK. So I, I come from the coffee region in Colombia. And I grew up in a coffee farm. I work with coffee. I love coffee, but I don't drink it. 
<laughs> I cannot drink it or too much of it. So if you're meeting Leah, ask her for a tea, not a cough. Next, I want to introduce Andres from Salvia Ventures. He's the managing partner of Salvia Ventures. He's a VC investing in climate tech entrepreneurs. Before that, he was the managing director of NG Factory, NG's Latin Focus Corporate Venture Fund. And he has been a board member of the Chilean Venture Capital Association. And he's also a professor. He likes to teach about climate, and he teaches in the Catholic University of Chile. He's Chilean, but it's currently based in Mexico. And Andres, you want to share with the audience your fun or personal fact? If any of you want to learn how to do a Chilengo accent with as a Chile Mexico uh, hybrid combination, just uh, come and speak with me. Thank you. So. Chilango accent, that's what we should ask you. Chilango. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Got it. Six years of training. And last but not least, we have our entrepreneur in the room, Maricel Sainz. She's Costa Rican. She's from Costa Rica. I don't know how to say Costa Rica in English. Okay, good. <laughs> Maricel is the founder and CEO of Compound Foods. She's going to be telling us all about the amazing work that her startup is doing. She's, she was named Forbes 30 under 30, 30 under social impact category. Previously, she co-founded Next Biotics, another startup addressing antibiotic resistance. And she worked before in Monitor Deloitte in corporate strategy and innovative consultancies. She's, based, she's from Costa Rica, but is based here in the Bay Area. And Maricel, can you tell us your fun or personal fact? I don't, I don't know. Does this work? There we are. Uh, I don't know how fun it is, but I really enjoy scuba diving, I say, because it's the only time that I can actually shut up. <laughs> um, and the more sharks there are, the better. So yeah, the more closer the sharks get, the, the happier you are scuba diving. So okay, if you love scuba diving or like the ocean, talk to Maricela about it. And my name is Natalie Vergara. I'm Colombian, based in Cartagena, as I said, and I'm with Mercy Corps Ventures, an impact investor working in emerging markets, mainly in Latin America and Africa. We invest in companies in ag tech, food tech, and climate tech. And my fun fact is that I love dancing, I love music, and like if you'll see me around, you'll see me moving, but I don't know any lyrics of any song, so I make up my own lyrics of the songs that I like. <laughs> awesome. So now that you, you, can, you know a little fact about us, we can start talking about the main topic of discussion today. So really, like the first question we wanted to ask about this, and I'm going to start with you, Yuri, since you've been studying this for a while, it's really to put us in the scene, like what is really happening with climate change, particularly in Latin America, and why is it different in Latin America than in other different, than in other regions of the world? No, sure, and, 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 and this is something that's, that's close to my heart also, uh, passion of mine for, for, uh, for many decades. Um, uh, so I'll just share a, a very brief anecdote. Uh, maybe two months ago, uh, I was attending a Yale seminar on climate economics. They have a great seminar um, that, that they do monthly. And we're looking at some of the projections of 50 years out, right? If we don't do anything, 50 years out, what's going to happen? And, and, and and it was it was pretty it's was, it was pretty dismal in the sense that um, both in terms of of um, damages due to climate change, also in terms of migration conflict, and Latin America actually has a lot of these risks. We have a lot of risks in Central America. We have a lot of them concentrated in Mexico, and and we have a huge amount of concentration of risk in Brazil and some of the Andean countries also. So so when we're looking at at the 50-year projections, we're talking about massive um, shifts of people and of GDP out of regions where right now are some of the wealthiest regions that we have. So it's 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 a huge it's a huge deal. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's one of those things that it, it it continues to get worse and worse and worse. Okay, so so that's the the downer, right? But I'm not a downer person. I'm a very optimistic person. So what does Latin American have? Latin American has one of, and not one, it has par excellence, the largest reserve of essentially natural capital on the planet, and, and not just the Amazon, um, and throughout, distributed throughout, throughout, throughout the region. 
Um, that means the largest reserves of biodiversity, of fresh water, of air, the largest carbon sinks, and in terms of coastal resources, um, the, the, the largest uh, or some of the largest uh, um, are reserves of, of natural capital and coastal resources too. Now what is the problem with that? The problem is that we really don't know yet how to integrate this wealth of, of, um, of, of, of natural assets into our lives in a way that's sustainable. Um, we know that estimates are about nine trillion dollars, okay, in terms of uh, kind of nature-based economics. But when you look at the nature-based economics that are currently transacted on the planet, what do you think they are? They're gonna be in agriculture, they're gonna be in extractives, okay? So essentially that dominates all of our nature-based uh, transactions right now. And for every dollar that we have in nature-based transactions that we're transacting today, essentially in agriculture and extractives, we're, we probably have about 10 or even 20 additional dollars which are in aspects of nature um, which are uh, regenerative and which produce additional value of capital that's good for nature rather than being uh, kind of exploitative in nature. Um, so, so this, this is, and, and, and a lot of it's concentrated in our region, right? And we have people here, well, all of us here, who are actively involved in developing these assets, right? Everyone here is doing that. So, so anyway, I know you want to keep it short, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut up now. <laughs> but I think that is the huge asset that we have in the region. We have a huge risk, huge risk, and we have a huge asset also. Yeah, thank you, as you said, I love that summary. We have a huge asset and we have a huge risk. So with that scenario, I'll pass it over to Leah to ask this question of like, what does it look like in LATAM? So if we dream and we think about 10 years down the horizon, like how do we live up to, live up to these risks and these assets? Like what's the future life for Latin America in 10 years when we think about climate solutions? What's your dreams? Well, I think uh, what we expect is that, uh, for example, biodiversity credits become what carbon credits are today. And these markets around nature-based solutions become mature. So it's not just VC or startups that are starting to create these uh, value chains and building on, on these um, uh, market, but that these becomes something that it's almost mainstream and that it's actually part of the strategy of every single company in Latin America. And we also see that uh, our women are taking the lead on this. And there are lots, and instead of becoming like, or being uh, in most of the speeches, like the most vulnerable of climate and climate change. So it's taking the lead on action. And it's good to see that we're three women working on this in a panel in Latin America. Uh, so so this, is, this is also something that, that we believe could be like our vision for the future. Love it, yeah. How about you, Andres? What's your dream or what's your vision when you're thinking about climate solutions 10 years down the road in Latin America? Uh, no, how I see it, it's gonna be a completely different Latin America to what we know now. Uh, we could uh, deep dive on uh, uh, what Yuri was talking about. We're gonna have climate migrations, we're gonna have um, different challenges, but we will also have, in 10 more years, 50 to 100 unicorn companies in the climate space born from Latin America. I have no doubt about that. So we do have the resources, but also Latin America has the human capital, has the talent. So as a fund, we've seen that firsthand. There are hundreds now of talented, some deep tech, some are not, um, climate solutions that are scalable globally, and we're gonna see that, uh, we've, we have been seeing that already, that's only gonna grow. So 10 more years, LATAM is recognized as a, call it, global incubator for uh, climate solutions. So climate solutions, unicorns led by women. I like this future. How about you, Marisa? What can you add to this future in Latin America in the next 10 years? Yeah, well, 
I hope that we really thinking about how we are making all of the things that we consume with planet in mind. So I envision a future where we think a lot about regeneration and how do we think about conservation of biodiversity and looking at transitioning a lot of our current monocultures in more biodiverse systems where it's gonna be better for the planet and for all of us consuming it. And I'll just add an extra layer there of saying that I'm hoping that 10 years from now, every single government and every single political party has climate solutions as the center of their agenda and that that's what's driving how we're electing our leaders because I totally agree that I hope we have unicorns and I hope companies are involved, but if we don't have government setting regulations around how do we use our resources, we won't be able to transform the region. So government involvement, and Judy, anything you want to add to this 10 year future ambition? Well, I think it's, you know, regulation, public, uh, public policy. Um, by the way, the region is leading in public. I'm not going to single out. I'm just going to say Chile is doing very well. Uh, Brazil is doing very well. Colombia is doing very well. Costa Rica is do, doing very well. Could do better, but is doing very well. You know, has a trajectory. It's kind of a little blip, but we'll see it going forward. So it, it's a rich region of climate action and, and, and commitment to to, to to climate. So I think that's that's that, that's there. I I love the idea of the unicorns, and I love it of, of just multiplying the activity and that we're going to have in the entrepreneurial um, uh, sector. Um, I mean. It, it's, it's, it's just going to be, it's just going to be, it's going to be tremendous. And, and you know, we've worked together for uh, IDB, we worked together with, with you for, for so many years. And, and I think this, this view of, um, of kind of understanding what it, not just for the scientific side and, and the, the molecular side, which is so important, but, but the view of understanding uh, kind of nature and biodiversity from the systemic side. It needs so much nurturing for us to actually make that happen. But I think that's absolutely correct. We need to we need to push it in that direction also. Anyway, so I love it. Yeah, I love this future of thinking how can Latin America be positioned in a unique position to to make this drive. And but before we go there, let's think like how are we going to get there? And I also we wanted to ask the audience a question on what's the state right now. So I'm gonna do like, again, like raise the hands and Yuri is going to help me with this if I get anything wrong. But basically the question is, you know, we all have like the Paris Agreement, which really we have the aim of keeping global average, increasing in, in global average temperature below two degrees. So the question is, raise, I wanna raise your hands and like the question is, if you believe if we're going to keep the increase, the increase in global average temperature below one degree Celsius. Raise your hand if you think we're going to keep the increase of global average temperature below one degree Celsius. That's a good audience. It's a trick question. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think we're going to keep the increase of global average temperature below 1.5 degree temperature, degree Celsius. Come on, optimists in the room, 1.5. 1.5, there we go, one, one, someone more for 1.5, no? Two, two, three, four, all right, all right. And now raise the, the, the hand if you think we're going to give it at least below the two degrees. Okay, and above the two degrees? Okay, so we have some pessimists in the room. So basically, like, yeah, this is what got get us to, to the place where we are right now, and I think, like, we need to work on like the reality is that we need to work on both ways. So we need to work on solutions that are going to help us that we really don't get above two degrees, but the reality, as Yuri can explain better, is that we already mix the, the, the deadline on the one degree. So indeed, the temperatures are getting higher and we need to live with that. We need to understand what are the solutions that are going to help us to better adapt to climate change. So. Now, time for the solutions. I want each one of you to present one solution and like, please make it under us understand that solution so we can pitch it and explain to anybody else that we're talking about. One solution in climate change. It can be either in mitigation or in adaptation, but one solution that you think us could lead us to this dream future that we're thinking about in 10 years in Latin America. 
and I will leave it to whatever one. No, first, Maricel, which is the one that is working every day <laughs> she has a on one solution. So please, Maricel, tell us about your solution. In a minute. So um, we believe that if we use upcycled ingredients or agricultural side streams, things that we can grow in countries like the U.S. and transform them using fermentation, then we can create products that are climate proof, that can compete in terms of price, but have a reduced burden on the environment. And we measure that in water use, carbon emissions, land use without having to sacrifice the quality of the product, because one of our core beliefs is that we need to empower consumers to make better sustainable choices, and the way that we do that is by giving them actual choices where the, the, it's not really a sacrifice, but, but a true empowering option. So that's our solution. Oh, but explain seconds. us a bit more how it works, please. I want to know. <laughs> yeah. So what, what we've done, uh, for those of you that don't know, at Compound Foods, we're working on recreating coffee without using coffee beans, which it's controversial when you talk to Latin Americans about it. I'm originally from Costa Rica, so we are a proud coffee-producing country. But coffee has a couple of main issues when it comes to climate change. The first one is that when we look at its resource intensity, it actually ranks fifth in our value chain. That's above poultry, swine, fish, eggs, in terms of carbon emissions per kilogram of coffee, as well as water intensity. And on the other end, climate change is making it harder and harder to produce coffee. So as demand increases and production decreases, there's going to be a gap in the supply. So our thinking is, if we think about what coffee actually is, is an extraction of chemical compounds that are perfectly balanced. And we started with the question, is there a better way that we can get those chemical compounds? Can we get them from plants that are wasted in other processes? For example, we use grape seeds that are wasted in the winery process as one of our molecular inputs, as well as fermentation. So we go back to the farms and learn from the farmers how they can change coffee flavors using different fermentation processes and try to recreate that in the lab. And our goal is that by developing the understanding of one of the most complex products out there, it has over 800 different flavor compounds, we develop this ability to understand, once we have a molecular map, how do we use more sustainable ingredients and fermentation to recreate that. So in the world that we envision, we're not you know, cutting trees, planting them, waiting five years for us to pick them, going through an incredibly long supply chain to get to the final product, but instead we can use that land and regenerate it to products that hopefully will be consumed locally and regionally. Isn't this super cool? Wow. <laughs> that, like that we can have, I think like uh, next time we need to have like a coffee sample so that we can yes. drink all these coffee. But I think like it's amazing of these solutions that are coming from Latin America of like super high tech, high innovative of growing coffee without coffee beans. That's amazing. And yeah, and, and I think like we have, we need like one of the things that we also have been talking about while preparing for this panel is like we need all spectrum of solutions. This is amazing and super cool and interesting, but we also need other solutions that maybe are not as high tech or flashy as amazing job that Maricel is doing. So maybe Leah, you can talk about the other lower tech type of work that you're also doing with coffee producers or related to coffee or any other solution that you wanted to, to highlight. Yes, and it's actually an example of why we need these type of solutions. Uh, and for, we invest, uh, one of our funds invests in coffee cooperatives in Central America and South America. And um, we had to develop a project uh, like five years ago for some of these cooperatives in the lower lands. They were, they were, these lands were no longer um, feasible for coffee production. So they had to switch to, to cocoa and we finance a project to, to like make the change from smallholder farmers producing coffee to produce cocoa and build the value chain within these cooperatives. So this is not something of today. This is not something about keeping the, 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 like the temperatures down. It's something that happened already five years ago that we had to do this investment. And it's also uh, to show that adaptation is needed. Even if we still want to to, and we're optimists, I think, here in this, in this panel on, on how to keep the, the, the temperature, or that we are going to reach these goals to keep temperature down or keep growth as low as possible. And we, we anyway have to start working on adaptation and keep adaptation as a top priority for Latin America. And I loved that, how that loop closes of like, Marisol is building new coffee without coffee beans, and you're working with how to make sure that the smallholders that were producing coffee can continue to have a livelihood now producing another type of product. So it's like, yeah, we need all these type of solutions. 
How about you, Andres? Tell us about an inspiring solution on climate that you've been working with. I'll be biased as well, so I have to speak of one of our investments. Just to give one example, our uh, first investee, Strong by Form, it's a Chilean-born company which developed a composite of wood that can replace concrete. So what on earth does this mean? Concrete is one of the hardest industries to decarbonize and one of the industries that cause the most pollution, as most of you know. This company has created a, what you could call digitally printed wood, where the, how the wood is interwoven in the digital printer, which is a large um, installation with advanced robotics. They create a slab that has the resistance to replace concrete. Basically, this company was uh, the CTO uh, has a PhD from the University of uh, Dusseldorf. They started the company in Chile, had clients in Chile, uh, received their anchor investor from a large forestry company in LATAM, and now they are receiving most of their investment in Europe from companies like Pfeiffer, that's a big German company on construction materials. They just finished the, their seed round for 4.5 uh, million, which they oversubscribed. And we're talking about frontier tech uh, that uh, can go at global scale. And uh, that, is, that was born here in uh, Latin America. Awesome, so also very high tech wood, to compost side of wood to produce concrete. So it looks like a, you can look it up, strong by form. They're presenting right now at Verge. It looks like a bit of a slab uh, made of wood. It's the, how to describe, you can look it up in uh, Instagram. And Yuri, how about you? Tell us about some of the inspiring solutions that you're seeing. Um, so we, we actually don't do any things ourselves, so we just, invest in great ideas and, and which and of course people. we need they, the solutions need the money <laughs> so. to grow those solutions so we need you <laughs> so I'll, I'll also talk about a, a partnership that we've we've been developing for oh I'm gonna say about five years and it's with uh, well they're now called the intrinsic exchange group but back then they were called something else and the the objective of this is is to be able to find a way for companies which are developing uh, natural capital to be able to list um, in exchanges and be able to be uh, recognized and um, have the rules of listing that accommodate the particularities of what a natural asset company would be. So, so um, we've been working with Doug Eagler, Eager for, for many years. Well, he's been working really, it's his, his, uh, his company. Um, and, and right now we already have um, the parameters for, for listing a company as a natural asset company um, established in the New York Stock Exchange. We hope it'll be established in NASDAQ. We have a project to establish it in the stock exchanges of Latin America. And, and, that, and that means it defines um, the commitments that the company has to do. It defines in some way also on the regulatory side the tax treatment. It defines the reporting requirements or protection of, of, of shareholders, et cetera. So, so we've, we've not yet had a listing of a NAC company in the New York Stock Exchange or in NASDAQ, but you know, maybe it'll be minus. Maybe minus will be the one that says, we're gonna list and we're gonna list as a NAC, right? Or maybe one of, one of the companies in your portfolio. So that's super important because it allows, um, it allows you to raise capital in, an, in, in a way that's established but channeling it towards the companies which are going to have tremendous impact in nature. So I think that's, uh, that's something we've done with Doug, and I thought it was, I thought it was really, really interesting. And a follow-up question is, like, how do we make sure that this amazing high-tech, low-tech solutions, like, how do we make sure that they grow and become the future that we were thinking about LATAM, where we have unicorns, where we have women-led organizations, where we change our production practices, where we change our consumer practices. So, like, also, like, what do you think we need to, to get there where we are now, where we have all these amazing solutions and young startups, maybe some more developed, to, to get to that future and that dream? 
I think we need better communication. I think like I work in climate tech and I find it so confusing to really know like what's going on, when things are gonna happen, how should I be preparing? And one of my friends who works in the cultivated meat space, he was one time telling me like the big companies don't really need to say bad things about us, they just need to confuse people because that's enough, right? And there's so much information out there that's like really, really difficult to discern what's actually gonna happen. Like I wanna do a personal project of like mapping out, right? Like what does this domino effect look like as we're hitting or not hitting some of these timelines? And I look for that information and it's hard to find. So I think it's if we wanna empower consumers and we wanna empower organizations to make better decisions, we need better sources of information and sources of truth that we can go at and, and find what's, what's really gonna happen. And I would say digestible information, no, because as you said, it's sometimes really hard to understand it, right? Yeah, not everybody wants to sit down and read the scientific academic papers. Or nobody has a PhD. <laughs> How about you, Andres Leandri? What do you think we need for those solutions to really become the dream? I, I, um, I agree. It's the communication piece and the education behind just putting the commercial opportunity out there. So um, as fund manager, our, part of my uh, work is we speak with investors, so the investors of, in the fund, uh, they, they're called LPs, uh, about the climate opportunity. And everyone here, I think, is aware of the climate opportunity, how big it is, but there's a, a large part of the wealth in LATAM that see it as something very distant still in terms of commercial returns. Some may see that fintech or other verticals are profitable, but they don't still see the opportunity um, behind, let's call it sustainability to be brought. So I think that's gonna be one of the game changers that uh, investors, entrepreneurs will start seeing that there's a huge uh, opportunity for financial returns behind climate solutions. And that's going to bring in more capital for more projects and uh, enable a lot of these uh, dreams we've put out there. How would you do, Ian Leah? What else do we need to get to that dream and vision? Education, more investments, more money, the commercial opportunity, what else? Yeah, well, in our case, we've been investing for impact uh, at Incofin for the last 20 years in Latin America. And we started with financial inclusion. So that was, I think, one of the key um, developments at the time uh, to also make sure that entre entrepreneurs and micro-entrepreneurs had the opportunity to start talking about or thinking about ideas and had the funding for developing these ideas. 10 years ago, we started investing in agri-food systems, uh, sustainable agri-food systems. And I think this was one of the biggest learnings from us to actually learn from the region and the communities and how smallholder farmers operate, how communities operate. And uh, so my, I think what we really need is solutions that are close to people and actually uh, going back to what our panel um, uh, the person that introduced your panel, I don't remember your name, <laughs> Rafael, <laughs> uh, said it has to be social, environmental, and financially sustainable. So it has to meet all three criteria. Uh, because if we want to attract capital, we need to have also investable opportunities that are attractive, not only from, from, from the, the environmental impact side, um, that can be profitable, but that also take into consideration people. So for us at Incovin, that's why we're working on developing two funds right now that have this link between social, environmental, and a, um, financial as any other impact investor, but, uh, but with, with bringing like our experience from the field, and we're actually working on a, in a fund uh, for the Amazon, um, that it's, it's focused on mezzanine debt for the Amazon um, for, uh, supporting SMEs in trying to, or no, in, in projects that build climate resilience and or have a component of biodiversity protection. Uh, but we think this is the type of solution, be, because we think this is the type of, of solutions that, w that mix uh, the three objectives in, 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 and that consider the, the, like the local knowledge that it's developed in the communities 
uh, that and, and, and that value nature on its own, but also that create opportunities around nature. Um, so I think that's that's the main challenge: how to combine these three and and how to also be linked to 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 the reality of the countries because it's very easy for, to say okay the, the solution is plant trees just plant trees in in deforested areas but how with whom are you going to do this so are you going to buy land and plant trees there and just uh, uh, promote a lot of migration uh, from these regions or how, how are you going to actually do it so it's not like a solution of plant millions of trees and that's it no, it's, it's having the connection with the communities. I think that's a great point, and I'm going to ask you, Julia, because we were also discussing before that one of the big challenges to get to that dream is like, how do we measure progress, right? Because when we're talking about climate mitigations, there's simple indicator, how many CO2 tons are you capturing or preventing to get from the environment? But when we're talking about climate adaptation, coming back to your point, like, how do we even talk about it? What is actually climate adaptation, how do we measure it? And I don't want it to completely get derailed because that's a very technical conversation, but if you can just give us a bit of sense of how do we need to move forward to work towards what Leo was saying of how are we going to be measuring this positive impact that these solutions are having so that we can attract greater investments to these types of solutions that they can prove that they're actually having that impact on the people on the planet and the commercial returns. No, I, I couldn't agree more, and I, I would say that the, the two challenges that we have internally are, as you mentioned, mitigation is, is, a, is, a, is a standard and kind of given by the goal almost, and, but the two challenges that we have are on, on measurement and tracking of adaptation and measurement and tracking of biodiversity. There are two things which are terrifically important for us to do, and where every day it seems like the science has moved, the science has advanced, and we're looking at it from a different angle. So that's good. That means we're not stuck in the same place. We're making, uh, we're certainly making progress. We're, we're understanding it better, but um, it's, it's, it's still far away from where you need to be for it to guide action, for it to like serve as, as, as a rudder of where you wanna go. Um, so certainly we have uh, kind of ecosystem approaches to adaptation, how resilient is an ecosystem. It's not uh, necessarily the person level or the household level or the company level. It's how all of this is, or the community level even, if it's how all of it's brought together. So um, there's, there's public policy layer on the ecosystem approach, and then there is kind of the individual areas of, of, um, of, of measurement at, at kind of household and, and, and firm level. And they're very interdependent in the sense that um, progress in one area could inadvertently generate problems in the area right next door, right? So you really have to be aware of the interdependencies and the interlinkages in, 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 in measurement. So, so I think that's, uh, that's a challenge for all of us. But um, I think it's, it, it's something, and related also is, is kind of the MRV frameworks that we have set up on the public side and increasingly on the private side related to uh, tokenization, re related to biodiversity credits, carbon credits, et cetera, and, and, and making sure that those are, that those are, are, are kind of working, working better. Uh, technological innovation in space, technological innovation in um, ground measurement, like, you know, so that's all going to allow us to move this really, really quickly in terms of, of, of the, the measurement space. So I'll, you know, so another question later I'll answer, answer about something else. But I think the measurement is super, super important and, and missing. Yeah, and just to add, that's also something that we're very actively working on because we say like, oh, we invest in climate. And then the first question is like, okay, but how do you measure it? So we're actually currently developing our climate adaptation framework to just to try to understand like, how are we measuring progress? What are we doing here? So yeah, happy to collaborate and to exchange notes with anybody working on the sector because we're also trying to figure it out. And the other point that we're also doing is like working with some of the companies in our portfolio that have a clear climate angle, but then working with the other ones that don't have the clear climate angle, but how do we make it clear? Like you need to worry about this because this is going to affect your business, your users, your employees. So I think that that also brings back to the point of what we were talking about, education, mainstream, and government, that it's, it, 
it's important for, for all. And this final question before we open it up to the audience with questions is, how do we attract more investments? Like, we have in the audience investors and LPs, and we're saying that one of the key important things is that we need more money in the region to make sure that the solutions grow and scale and become unicorns and stand their way of working. So what's your pitch to the audience that has money to say, like, why they should invest in climate solutions in Latin America? What's our competitive advantage? Who wants to start? Or Andres. <laughs> um, yeah, what's the pitch? We have hundreds of startups in the region that are resolving uh, climate change. And on the other side, we have this spiking demand from corporates for uh, climate tech solutions. So corporates are committing to the same goals you see in uh, developed markets. They want to get to net zero by some by 20, uh, 2030, some a little bit later. So we, we speak on a regular basis with uh, sustainability managers, corporate affairs managers, and we're seeing this sort of desperation in the air because they, they see their goals coming closer and closer. They need climate solutions, and it's not, it's not gonna be as easy as just importing all of them. So the demand is there, the startups are in place, and we're seeing startups that have more traction at lower valuations than you will see in uh, Silicon Valley. That's a huge opportunity to invest, scale solutions in LATAM, where we have the natural assets, and take them at a global scale. So commercial opportunity, great traction, lower valuation that can lead to higher returns. How about you, Maricel? Why more investments in the region in climate solutions? Well, I, I have a different perspective. I think when we think about climate solutions, we should come at them with like, does this, is this gonna be a big business or not? And, and take out like, let's not invest in it because of climate, as well as like, we don't wanna invest in women just because they're women. We wanna invest in it because they're amazing businesses. So the great opportunity here is that a lot of the people that are working on material innovation or food technology innovation is, the goal, we wanna make the best quality product at a competitive price. So if you think about this in the market, I was gonna say if, but when we make the best tasting coffee possible and we can also make it at the cheapest cost, the opportunity is gonna come from a market potential and not because it's more sustainable. So a lot of the companies these days have gone away from thinking about how do we meet goals and it's like, how do we give the market something that they could never turn away from? So higher quality, lower prices, big scale, and giving consumers what they want. So basically, we would only want to buy your coffee. It needs to be exactly. everywhere. I love it. I like it. <laughs> How about you, Leah? Yeah, I, I, would, I would add a little bit on, on what, what has been said. And I, I, I think it has to be a vision on the financial opportunity. And if you want to attract more money into Latin America, it has to be a great business. And it is. And take coffee. Uh, it's a billions of dollars of, of, of uh, a sector that it's worth billions of dollars. Uh, but it's but you have acai that it's growing at rates that are, yeah, huge. And there is palmito and there is a buruti and there is like all these uh, very like exotic products that we don't know much today about as a consumer, uh, but that are like really game changers in, in, in how we will be consuming in the future. And it's adding or re, like even raising awareness on the value of all these natural resources that are there that we don't have a, or that are not commercialized right now as, as, as the huge or, or like the big businesses, but that will be in the, in the next 10 years. And cosmetic, the cosmetics company, uh, the cosmetics uh, sector is growing a lot in Latin America based on nature solutions that are have components that are have yeah yeah that are like what you said. It's like millions of components of one little plant that creates uh, uh, things that are that are very very let me, yeah that could be very um, profitable. Okay, so the business opportunity of all these exotic plants that can be used for cosmetics or to be eaten that we love, it's based here. Like it. Yuri, what else? Why invest in Latin America climate solutions? I mean, I, I 
you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the two degrees where everyone raised their hands, and two and a half, three. Um, so the the reality is that there were, you know, infrastructure is going to have to be essentially reinvented. Materials have to be reinvented. Agriculture reinvented. What do I mean by reinvented? I mean, you just have to turn on the news to see what is happening, right? It gets too hot, and, you know, suddenly the metro in Washington doesn't work because the rails separated. Uh-oh, that's a problem. We need to go and rebuild all that infrastructure. It gets too hot, and, oh, my God, the planes can't take off anymore because, you know, the air density has changed, and, the you know, the air over the wing is, is, is less dense. That means there's less lift. That means it needs more runway. That means it can't go. So they have to be parked there and waiting. All of this is going to continue and continue and continue, and it's a business opportunity, right? It's a business opportunity. Um, coffee is a business opportunity. If we didn't have anything going on in climate change, probably the motivation would be slightly less. I'm sure it's delicious, and we're all going to go to your, your coffee, but the motivation would not be as strong as it is right now. So I think, I think that, um, that part of communicating in a medium term, what is going to be necessary. Um, you know, we all started with insurance and FinTech and this stuff, and, and now we understand it's everything. So, I mean, I think that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the business case that, that, that we need to, that we need to be um, making right now. I love it how you put it, changing the challenges to business opportunities. So now I'm gonna open up, like I know we are questions, we're a small room, so anybody has any questions? Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, data availability is always a concern. I wouldn't say in just emerging markets. I would say it's a concern everywhere. Um, if anything, I think that the gap in data availability has been reduced in emerging markets because of tech innovation, mostly. Um, and, and some of the dependence on, on kind of brick and mortar legacy infrastructures to produce data have been overcome with technology and not just in the financial sector, but I would say across the board. Um, so I think that's, that's certainly, uh, you know, I mentioned satellite data, uh, ground measurement. Um, um, I think I, the MRV frameworks are super important, and I think they're important for investors and they're important for um, not just investors, but everyone who's going to participate because they're going to be also purchasers or consumers at one point. Um, um, what, I, what I would say is, compared to where we were even five years ago, the data availability is vastly better, vastly better. So I think it's, I'm not saying it's not a problem, it's a problem, but I think we're, we're really moving in that direction. And I would just add that I think like in Latin America, there's also a sense of collaboration among actors that maybe is not the same in other regions in the world. So if you reach out to other investors or entrepreneurs, I think like we still have this feeling of we have to figure this out together. So like my other advice would be like, yeah, to reach out to actors in the region and looking for the data that you're looking or for collaboration, because I, I do think like we do have like the spirit of building this together because we still need so much more money. So even like, yeah, when, when everybody's raising money and talking to LPs, we are rooting for our neighbor because we still need more money and more investors and more entrepreneurs and more actors in the region. So that will be my other take. And I would, add, I would add that technology plays a key role for that, too. So this is also that something that we're seeing in the region, that technology is actually, and, and Actex and Fintechs and all these like uh, technology-driven companies are actually building these data and measuring and making it a little bit more transparent for, for, for all the stakeholders. And we have a question for the from the audience. How can we involve the government to the climate solutions? And am I going to put you in the spot, Maricel, that I think you were leading some initiatives, so if you want to tell us about a practical way of how to make this happen. Involve the government? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone has ideas. I'd, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> um, I mean, my, my approach has been with the government of Costa Rica. I, I've been very open about what we're doing, and it's 
actually been interesting the amount of research that they've done. For example, Costa Rica went through this process where they had 250 different crops and went through an analysis of which ones are we most competitively positioned to grow. Turns out it's not the things that we're growing. But there are 10 items that are ideal for us to be growing in places like Costa Rica where we would be able to grow them at better efficiency than anywhere else. So we're working with not the government, but an adjacent partner to help coffee farmers transition into more climate resilient crops. So we are donating percentage of our revenue to actually do intercropping systems where we're getting them to diversify their income. My goal is that if this works, and there are case studies that they've already tripled their income in many ways, we can use it as a case study to bring it to the government and say, like, why do we have 90,000 hectares of Costa Rica planted in coffee when you know we don't even make that much money? Most of our coffee farmers are actually below the poverty line. The money is being made by the roasters here and you know a across Europe. So like, why don't we transition our country to grow what we are most competitively positioned to do? They have the research, and my goal is that we can you know come in with the data of saying we've we've demonstrated that, and, and that is has been our government relationship so far. Any other insights or examples? I mean, I, th I think the government is, governments are kind of fully engaged in different dimensions of this problem already. Um, a few things that I, that, that I would focus on. Um, yesterday we were talking about um, facilitating financial flows into the sector, and that has a lot to do with the government enabling this to happen. Um, we're talking about open banking initiatives in Brazil, which are going to, you know, recruit capital from outside. This capital can easily be directed towards, you know, the highest impact and the highest return on on the climate um, agenda. So, so I think that's that's super important. Um, you know, R and D efforts in Latin America are not where they should be. They're lagging behind. They're underfunded. Uh, talent is not well managed. The relationship between research, develop, and companies and innovation is not what you see in Silicon Valley. It's not what, you know. So there's a lot more to be done on that, not just putting more um, funding, but working in a more collaborative uh, way, in a, in, in a more dynamic way with, with um, between government and enterprise in Latin America. So I certainly, I think that is, is absolutely um, necessary. And then there are like, like public goods that governments need to be doing more of. Um, uh, you know, understanding the characteristics of land. Uh, you know, it's, it's not reasonable to have every entrepreneur company go and understand what the characteristics of land are. This is something that governments have to do. They have to make these maps and, and, and data sets openly available for everyone. And, you know, everyone can compete in a fair marketplace. But these are certain aspects which are really um, um, specific of what, of, a, of what government should be doing. And in Latin America, I think they need to be they need to be pushing this um, clearly in in, in, a, in a better direction that they've been doing. I, I would add quickly that I think at least in Latin America, from from the con in the countries that we work with, it's a topic that it's that governments have in the agenda, and it's a key element of the agenda. For example, South America right now, it's becoming bioeconomy is like the top uh, one of the top. Uh, topics in their agenda, in, like in, in the political agenda, things move slow, uh, so it takes time. Uh, and coming from the private sector, I also think that the solution is not only the government. So, so the, the solution is it's, it's from everyone, uh, even consumers. So it has to be, it has to be uh, like, I think the role of the private sector is also key. Even when maps are not available, you see institutes and you see universities and you see all these uh, stakeholders participating in building like the conditions to have a market uh, for, for nature and, um, and, and relying only in governments will not take us very far. <laughs> Can I add one more thing? I also think we need more citizenship participation. Like, it just feels like we've all checked out, at least my generation. I feel like none of my peers ever considered working for the government. They were initially like, I want to go to a startup or I want to go work for a big company. But it's like, if it's not us who have a vision of what the world should look like and what we want the world to look like that are working to build it, then who are we letting it in hands of? But 
government also seems like such a scary place for a lot of younger people. So how do we actually get citizens engaged in saying what we want government funds to be invested in and what policies do we want driven? It's more of a question than an answer. <laughs> We're then supporting those that want to take that step and, and work in government. That's a good one. Just a quick one. That it, it, no, navigating, uh, in, uh, doing lobbying with governments, it's highly complex, depends on the, a lot in the country. Uh, one of our investors is the uh, former Ministry of Environment of Chile, where she promoted uh, the framework for the climate change law. We've had this discussion, and you need to find the avenues for in each country where there are some, uh, for example, in Chile you have the GORFO, that's you would translate it at the, the, the promotion corporation, it's part of government, and they do all sorts of subsidies, and they wanna be close to what's happening on the tech space. So the, the, the appetite from governments to get closer to the climate solutions, we see it there. They just uh, are a bit distant to what's happening on the ground, and we've seen that uh, appetite to increase that dialogue. It's just a matter of finding the right pathways and stakeholders. Yeah, so greater collaboration. So just to close, I'm going to allow you, if of you, please to one or two phrases to close up, call to action, announcements, reflections. Um, just. We're, I, at, I, we're I, out of time. I, I, I know, <laughs> oh, yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, remind everyone also that the single, mo the single largest investor in climate is the government, okay? By a long shot. Um, that for nature swaps that we're doing in Ecuador, these are all government level initiatives. So, so um, what can the government do more, I think, is, is, is kind of the discussion. It's not to say that they're you know, not relevant. They're absolutely central to the climate. The COP is an agreement of governments. They sign agreements there. Um, they don't always follow through on them, but they do sign them. So, so they, that's, you know, that's their natural purview, their natural function. So, um, the closing. Yeah, your call to action, announcement, okay. or reflection, two phrases. My call to action, announcement. Well, the announcement that we have is um, we are, um, Caro's not here anymore, but we are launching a, a decarbonization initiative. We're actually going to launch it at COP in December. So, I think it's a super exciting opportunity to work with companies in decarbonizing their carbon footprints and also bringing in entrepreneurs and innovators to be able to get that done. So, you know, Latin Pacto and IDB Lab will be launching that in COP. I think it's gonna be great. And um, anyone who's interested, you know, um, we, can, we can discuss that. It's, it's, uh, it's super needed. Leah? So we have two announcements. We're launching two funds. Uh, one uh, for microfinance, uh, climate smart microfinance institutions in, in uh, worldwide. So if you have a fintech or a financial institution that is active in this, talk to us. Uh, and, or an investor also. Uh, and we're also launching an initiative for the, for the Amazon, on, uh, as I mentioned, climate uh, focused on, for SMEs. Uh, so climate uh, resilience and biodiversity protection. So also if you have, you're an entrepreneur, uh, reach out uh, or investor interested in this reach out and maybe the the, the very quickly <laughs> the uh, call to action as a consumer I think it's uh, we're all consumers so uh, we really should be thinking about valuing more nature as consumers Andres we are with Savia, our first fund, Savia One. We're on this uh, dead set mission of finding the best deals in Latin America. Uh, we're gonna invest in approximately 20 companies. So if you uh, know of any startups or are interested in the space, uh, follow us on LinkedIn. Feel free to uh, reach out. We're also producing regular content. That's uh, one ask. And the other one is a big thank you to the audience, because uh, all the ones that are here are the ones that know what the urgency is and are the climate rebels we need. So um, yeah, thank, thanks to everyone. Uh, mine is an invite, so if you are still in town, 
this Friday, we are hosting an event where you can try two of our products and we're also raising funds for our partners in Central America. You can ask me for information or it's also on our LinkedIn to, to register. I'm going. And my announcement and my call to two. One, we have a climate tech facility where we're looking for climate innovations in Latin America to try new solutions and new products. So if you're interested, it's in our website. You can apply and we're providing grant funding to provide to test the solutions. And the second one is that tomorrow we're going to be in the investor speech deck talking a bit more about what we do it at MCD. So you're all invited. It's at 1 p.m. tomorrow. And just before you take the microphone away, Rafael, since I'm the moderator, I just want to close out with my three points that I was taking from all the conversation. Thank you again for, for such a vibrant conversation. Like the first one I think like was raised upon. It's like really we need solutions to prevent the weather and the temperatures to continue to rise, but we also need to invest in solutions and to look for solutions that are going to help us adapt to the new law, the new world that we're going to live in, because it's a reality. The world is getting hotter and we need to adapt to it. The second one is that Latin America has a unique and an incredible position and that we have these amazing solutions, entrepreneurs and overall ecosystem that is working towards these solutions. So. We need more financial investments and like the opportunity, it's there, the market, it's there and the solution is there. And the third one, it's like related to the communication and the language, like even for us that work in the climate space, sometimes to like be honest to ourselves and have those real conversations. And when we're talking like, how do we measure this and how do we do it? Like to not start to throw all this jargon away, but try to keep it simple and try to understand that like, yeah, maybe we're not experts on the matter, but we all care about it. So how do we, can we, work together and communicate in a simple and effective way towards investing and supporting to scale more climate solutions in LATAM. Thank you.